Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and we're here today for another episode of Page Chewing, and this this time on episode 45. I had to look up the title because there's so many of them now, but uh, we are very thankful to be here with uh, Gareth L. Powell. Thank you, Mr. Powell, for joining us. Yeah, oh, thanks for having me. And for those who aren't familiar with you or your work, can you give us a, an introduction? Oh, okay. Sum myself up in a snappy soundbite. Um, yeah, I'm a science fiction writer based in the US. I've written 17 published books, 10 of which have been novels. Um, I've won the BSFA award for best novel a couple of times. Um, first time I tied with for first place with Anne Leckie for Ancillary Justice. Um, and I think I'm one of the most shortlisted people in the 50 year history of the award. Um, my most recent novel, uh, Descendant Machine, came out last week from Titan Books in the UK and the US. Um, and I'm here to talk all about it. Nice. And of course, we're here with uh, my lovely co hosts, <laughs> Taylor and PL. Will you give us quick introductions as well, please? Sure. So I'm Taylor. My book channel is Made Between the Pages. As Steve just mentioned, I am a co-host on Page Chewing, so you'll find me quite often on Steve's channel, and I'm just excited to be here. And Pia? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Pia Stewart. I'm an author and a blogger, and uh, again, uh, honored, like Taylor said, to be a co-host of Page Chewing alongside my wonderful compatriots in Steven Taylor, where you can most often find me beside them on one of their channels and uh, soon to be mine in the future because I'm crazy enough to start thinking start thinking about starting a YouTube channel. So uh, yeah, I'm an indie author and I'm really excited to be here. Um, you know, Gareth is is an icon in the writing community and someone who a lot of us look up to. I'm here embarrassing him now, but uh, you know, and of course, as, as a writer. So uh, yeah, I can't wait to, uh, to learn more about uh, his work. I have read uh, one of his books, uh, like Tristan, that he co-wrote with uh, Peter Family, it was fantastic. I haven't had a chance to put a review up yet, but wow, this was this was marvelous. So, very much looking forward to reading uh, more of his work. So. And we want to get into your own congratulations on the book release uh, last week. We, we want to get into that. We wanted to kick things off and I think hopefully not too much of a depressing question to start off with, but we wanted to know what your vision was for our future. Oh, well, I mean, it's all going to be fine. Um, <laughs> there we go. That's, that's a good place to start. <laughs> it, it, it's going to be fine. Um, it, it, obviously, it could go one of two ways. Well, one of a million ways, but one of two main ways. Um, and we have a couple of big existential crises facing us at the moment in the uh, the climate and um you know the antibiotic resistance and uh, you know who knows ai might rise up against us in the next couple of weeks we seem to be sliding into a singularity at the moment so i mean we've got no idea i mean obviously you know hope for the best prepare for the worst and um you know i think i like to think that we have a future because obviously my job is about writing about it. So um, you could say that any science fiction set more than 20 years in the future is a, an act of outrageous optimism. But um, I like to think in my books, I like to think there are ways we can, we can get through the troubles that are facing us um, somehow. Um, and I think when the chips are really down, we will actually try. I'm actually quite new to the genre myself, admittedly so. I'm, I'm coming from fantasy and I have picked up some sci-fi, you know, over the years and I've become more interested in it. And something that I find so interesting about it is often the thought experiments that are in the writing, right? So there's so much possibility with sci-fi, especially when you're talking about the future. And to hear you say that, with your, our, to hear you say that you hope that there's a way to find our way through what we're going through at the moment, whatever that may be, 
Uh, do you find that sci-fi helps you in those thought experiments, working through writing it? So when you're writing sci-fi, do you are you able to work through, okay, we have these issues, these are some ideas we could work with in the future. Do you think that it's a good thought experiment maybe for others to do as well? well that's one of the things that's so vital about the genre is that you can set up any thought experiment. Um, so, for instance, if you, uh, you, you want to say, well, how would society be if we made X and Y changes? You can create that society and write about what it would be like to live there and maybe think through the problems. Um, or, or, for instance, with the AI that's coming at the moment, a lot of people are kind of freaking out and going, what the hell is, is this? But sci-fi writers have been working through those questions and working through the uh, the implications for decades and we're like yeah okay we can see where this is going we can see what's happening um so it's a very good tool for mapping and modeling potential futures and what it would be like to live in them um i wouldn't lay any claim that it's predictive in any way um what we do we i mean we're not trying to accurately predict that well i'm not trying to accurately predict the future i'm trying to entertain people but i'd like to have some um at least some plausibility in the stories but um from what i was saying i mean uh from how it helps me i mean i i grew up in the um i'm a child of the 70s and 80s so you know i remember being a teenager in the 80s and being absolutely convinced we were all going to die in a nuclear holocaust um, at any moment, we were having, you know, drills at school and there were public information films on the TV. So it was a very scary time. Um, so I think our generation have kind of lived with that kind of existential, not dread, but that kind of background awareness that, that the entire world could end in, in six minutes or whatever. And... I think that's that's kind of filtered through into my work quite strongly, um, especially in the book before this one, uh, Stars and Bones, which came out last year, uh, where I took a, a sort of daydream from my 80s self that um, it starts with there is a nuclear war escalates. Um, and um, just as it's, about, you know, everything's about to hit the fan, this kindly omnipotent alien comes down and puts a stop to it all and confiscates all our toys and puts us on the cosmic naughty step and that was like very much as a, as a teenager thinking what where are these aliens from star trek that can just step in and sort this stuff out because we're not doing a very good job so that's kind of it's there's that kind of wish fulfillment and um working through those issues as well when you're writing your stories, do you make a conscious effort to not make it too grounded in reality, to not make it too close to current events, to whereas there's that buffer from reality and fiction? Yeah, I mean, most of what I write is set in space. So it has, you know, um, with talking spaceships and talking cats. And so, I mean, it's a, usually, you know, quite a distance into the future. But I do like there to be some kind of sense about how we got there from here. So even if it's just like uh, uh, two or three sentence things, one of the characters said, there's that link to uh, just show that how we got there. So it's not like, uh, um, you know, it's not completely divorced from, from who we are, where we came from. Okay. So Gareth, what, so what compelled you specifically to write? science fiction was it that you know perhaps you know in school you had like a, a scientific quantitative background was it you know what what made you what was the drive to write specifically in that genre for you um well i mean it's the genre i grew up in um i was uh i grew up in so the very early 70s um i think the first time star trek was shown on uk tv um my mother used to sit me in front of star trek i was about three or four years old on an old black and white TV and I just, you know, it, it seeped in. And then um, I was six or seven years old when the first Star Wars movie came out. And then we had Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers and, and Flash Gordon. And it was just 
sci-fi tastic in the 70s and you know that huge star wars cash in that went on in hollywood um and that, that was it and I, at the same time i was going to my local library and they had a huge shelf of sci-fi so i was picking up and reading the robert heinlein juveniles um which confused the hell out of me because i didn't have a clue what a slide rule was they were they didn't they just weren't a thing in 70s in, in uk um but um yeah and I, I i moved on from there to sort of arthur c Clarke, larry niven um and then eventually william gibson and some more modern writers and so on so it was um it was very much the genre i, I kind of grew up loving um when i went to university um part of my course was creative writing we were forbidden under pain of death to write science fiction you know, we had to write literary fiction and literary um, so so i i would try and spike my teachers by fitting as much sort of stealth sci-fi in there as possible so and it's been a great source of satisfaction to me that i've, I've gone on and uh, got a, a career publishing science fiction to, uh, you know in spite of their advice so I hope we see a little snarky name in the thank yous in your books here and there <laughs> uh, for those teachers. But that is something that I think fans of fantasy and sci-fi can both commiserate on, um, you know, that it's often looked down upon in, in those uh, scenarios. But it's interesting hearing you mention Star Trek because my mother is also a Trekkie. And so the number of times I watched, you know, Trouble with Tribbles when I was little, <laughs> I remember that episode so clearly. And I'm curious if that was kind of one of your formative memories of the genre, is there still something specifically from Star Trek that inspires you to this day? Is there something that's kind of been a through line from that specific inspiration point that you still find you lean on? I guess... Um... It's the appreciation of sort of utopian cultures. So um, with Star Trek, um, I was exposed to, you know, at a young age to a society without, A, without money, without, you know, possessions and um, universal healthcare, universal employment, you know, you know, what you could possibly look, you know, what would be called kind of like a socialist utopia now, I guess, you know, luxury space communism. Um, and so that that was in the 70s, like the dark, deprived, economically dire 70s uh, and 80s in the UK. That was, you know, a shining kind of alternate utopia. And I guess reading through the culture novels of Ian Banks, um, which is a similar post-scarcity, highly technological um society and it's kind of it kind of drew me to the sort of possibilities of technology not in a kind of tub thumping technology is going to make everything brilliant way but more in a kind of how can we use things to make our lives better how could we make our lives fairer um and that's why in these last two books stars and bones and descendant machine it's set uh the human race is adrift in these these gigantic arcs um but everyone in the arc has everything they need because it, it, they, it's a closed system so they have clothes they have food they have health care they're basically living in one of the like the star trek utopia um and people say it's very difficult to get drama in a utopia but i've not found that i've found you can make utopias very dramatic so yeah, it's funny you say that. I think we're roughly around the same age. I was born in 69. So like you grew up in that same, uh, you know, the environment of the 80s and the 90s was a big, a big Trekkie myself, you know, I've loved, watched all the series and probably a million times with reruns because, it, you know, Star Trek's one of those things, it was so pervasive uh, in terms of TV. I remember growing up, like, you know, it would be on three, four times a day right in reruns and of course by then the series by the time I was I was uh I was you know starting to watch it was already the original series already in reruns and of course you know in in, in later times then the, all the new uh, series with next generation and so on and uh, it's funny you hit on that thread uh Gareth about um despite the fact that uh you know in your series it's utopian society saying okay you figure well it's utopian society so everything's perfect how can you find the the drama and the conflict that 
that we look for in fiction. But you know, I remember specifically for you know, I mean, you think about Star Trek, that um, so much of that that conflict was created uh, by humankind's thirst for exploration and bring us into contact with other species. And, you know, um, in Star Trek, of course, we know at, at the heart of it is, is you know, for, for Starfleet and their prime directive, this, this treading this line of, of non-interference um, with, with other uh, forms of life, yet, you know, um, you know, having to defend themselves, um, if there's a conflict, wanting to make sure that you know, societies don't go afoul, don't go astray. So um, I think when we talk about utopian societies and obviously you write about them, do you think that there is hope for us to achieve some sort of utopian society? I mean, you write about them. Um, I, I feel like in my heart, if you look back at, um, you you noted about, about writing something 20 years in the set in the future, is is really you know a hit or miss right because the technology changes so rapidly um you know things that were predicted to happen you know much earlier in our in our in in, in our future perhaps haven't and some have come to fruition sooner than expected um but yeah do you think we can we can ever achieve something like that based on today's um you know well i'd like to think so i mean technically we could achieve something like that today if the will was there um there are resources, you know, um, Jeff Bezos by himself could end world hunger and still be a billionaire. Um, you know, he, we could lift, you know, we could end poverty, we could end hunger, we could end deprivation, we could um, institute worldwide um, healthcare. But the will, is, the will is not there because um, the, the system we have prizes scarcity has value and is predicated on a myth of eternal growth um which in the earth being a closed system eternal growth is not possible um but the, the, that's the kind of mindset that uh, we're, we're locked into at the moment is the the kind of acquisitive um sort of late stage capitalism um i don't want to get too political or, or kind of whatever but we're locked into a system which has so much inertia that I don't know how we'll ever break it in order to restructure it to make life fairer and uh, easier for the rest of us. I mean, I'm seeing um, a lot of stuff about universal ba basic income uh, coming in, which sounds like a good step in the right direction to at least, you know, let people have money to to invest in their own health care to and start their own businesses and, and so on. So that, that's, but, you know, if change comes, it will either come hugely fast um or it will be a very slow drip 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 change um but you know so many um powerful loud groups seem to be dragging us back at the moment dragging trying to drag us back to this mythical kind of 1950s past where you know white picket fences and and um no you know wives in uh, aprons in the kitchen and has, you know it, it's it it's fr frustrating that we we have we have the means we just don't have the will to implement it at the moment i think the use of the word in inertia is really interesting there because as humans as a human race that you are correct that, that is that is part of what we are <laughs> i yeah. think and it can be a blessing both a blessing and a curse i think this uh, uh, this need to continuously move in some direction that we've we've sh we're already shifting towards um and the inability to kind of stay still as a race i guess i could say i think it's different culturally uh, different cultures definitely prioritize different things but as people from the west i think Culturally, we also value that. But I would argue, at least to me, it seems like human nature in and of itself is to continuously move forward. Do you, would you agree with that statement? Or do you think that that's simply something we've gotten used to thinking is normal? 
Well, I mean, we're, we're essentially very curious monkeys. Um, and we like to poke beehives with sticks to see what will happen. <laughs> and yeah. part, part of that, you know, we're explore, we're descended from people who explored the world on foot. And I think there is, there, there, there is part of that, but we've also evolved a way of transmitting our culture down the generations. And the unfortunate mm -hmm. side effect of that is it tends to, um, it tends to sort of imply a stability of culture. So there are some forces in society at the moment that are trying to keep everything the same in stasis. So, whereas there are other, uh, there's technological developments and things that are, are sort of racing ahead of where our cultural development is because we have this thing called tradition, which is basically peer pressure from dead people. And it stops us doing, um, it stops us maybe keeping up with our own capabilities as fast as we can or dealing with the, the ramifications because we still have these in, ingrained kind of um, uh, prejudices and um, uh, biases against certain technologies or certain um, that, that are opinions that have been filtering down through the culture for hundreds of years. And these are just the late, I mean, we're still seeing basically the American Civil War is still playing out psychologically um, because there are people who've just inherited those from their grandparents and their grandparents. And it's not that long ago, to be honest. And that's still playing out. And it's been playing out um, through the 60s and it's playing out now. Um, and so we have these, as you say, this cultural inertia that once things are in place, we try and keep them there, even while part of the rest of culture is racing ahead. And what we've had over the last 30, 40 years has been a huge cultural explosion in arts and music and and so on. And now I think there's a, um, and, and in freedoms and rights, and we're seeing now a certain bounce back and a certain uh, pushback against that. And people are saying, well, no, we need to get this back to traditional values. Um, and I think that's going to be the big fault line um, in the next, um, few decades because uh, that culture or the things that we really need to do, like um, address the climate crisis and address world hunger and, and so on, have been caught up into this culture war, which isn't really, which is um, not, not a good thing because it means instead of things that actually need to be addressed, they're now like trendy subjects that only one half of the debate will engage with and the other half won't. So I think that is going to cause a lot of trouble over the next few decades. Definitely. I just have to say peer pressure from dead people is going into my lexicon. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not my line. I, I think I, I saw that on, on Twitter or Facebook a while ago. <laughs> stuck. I can't remember who said it. Very nice. Had a, couple of, uh, a couple of comments really quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, our friend Daniel comments, I always thought the slow drip change would work, but the longer I live, the more I think the, uh, the opposite to treating people well, as opposed to seeking profit, will preclude anything but revolution. Our, our good friend Chris, well said, I hope one day in my lifetime we will see that went out. Until then, we have all the speculative, speculative fiction. And uh, Daniel, people are associating the self with their culture and imposing regression ideas, regress regressive ideas on others and them submitting, sublimating in their personal fear of death. And LTF, good morning. Uh, I feel egoism is a big showstopper. Yeah, and, and you know, I wonder, um, one thing that brings to mind this discussion is in reading um, Light Chaser, uh, Gareth, you know, what struck me about this book extremely well done there were so many things but and this book is about you know time travel and all sorts of things one thing struck me about this book and theme was that is it better to remain blissfully ignorant and unaware of what your real circumstances is if it seems that you know um, at least uh, what would optically from the people seems you're happy you're content you have all those creature comforts you have you know or is it better to know how dire your circumstances actually are is it is it is it better to especially if you know you figure and, and this this always brings 
the climate crisis in, into my mind, you know, you know, is it, you know, or you, you can look outside right now and, you know, there's, you know, what it's a cloudy day, but other than that, you know, in, in, the, in a little bubble, there seems fine. Right. But realizing that it's not fine. Um, so is that always fascinates me. And is that something that in this book in particular, uh, you, you wrote about in terms of, you know, um, you know, kind of blissful unawareness of what your circumstances are versus the reality of, of what's happening. Well, this this is uh, sort of like the character of Cypher in The Matrix, who, who yeah. wants to be put back in and have his memory of how awful the outside world actually is erased so he can just enjoy living in blissful ignorance. And it, there is a, uh, uh, there's definitely a huge attraction to ignorance. Um, I, you know, I would love to think, ah, climate change, bad, ah, not going to happen. Rise of fascism ah, won't affect me, and you know, and just get on with life. And I can, there's definitely, you know, we, we all have our own moments of complacency, and we all have um, moments when we just want to just pretend everything's fine. And um, like that dog, that dog in the meme, with sitting in a burning house drinking tea, saying this is fine. Um, yeah, we, we all do that. And to, to some, um, you know, I, I, I've had my own kind of uh, struggles where I think, well, I write books about spaceships for a living. Am I really helping in any way? And the arguments for and against that. So I just try and, you know, I, I never want to be a preachy author or, a, you know, a, a, I'm writing books that are fun and books that are entertaining that I enjoy. But I, also, my beliefs and my worries come through in them, um, inevitably, because you have to put everything of yourself into a book to make it authentic and true. So obviously, a lot of that comes through. Maybe if that helps people understand, maybe if uh, the, the, the post-scarcity society in my most recent couple of books has the same effect on me that watching Star on other people that have Star Trek had on me when I was young, of seeing this alternative way of living and, and maybe thinking maybe we can come round to something that's a little bit fairer and a little bit um, more equal for everybody. This book also delves into um, AI and and the role of AI um, in in their interactions with humanity and what role AI will, will play. Will it be a necessarily a benevolent role and a role that um, whereby AI is um, assisting us and helping us and is not necessarily autonomous and is not necessarily making decisions, you know, for us, or is it something a bit more sinister? And, um, you know, we talked about, about your vision for the future, specifically and AI, as we mentioned, has all kinds of implications for all kinds of things, and specifically for uh, we writers, it definitely has a lot of, you know, I believe somewhat, somewhat scary implications that are being hotly debated Right now, where do you see AI uh, going in terms of of humanity, in specifically in the in the coming years? I think AI is like any other tool that it can be repurposed as a weapon, um, and it can backfire. So, and it's also, I think, like a child that it will, um, as it's raised, is how it will grow. Um, you know. As, as as the twig is bent, so grows the branch. Um, it's, you know, we could raise it, and I think there's a high possibility somebody will try and raise it to um, become an autonomous battlefield application with drones and, and those creepy dog robots and things. They're bound to try and... Uh, um, and but I think, on the other hand, a lot of the... Uh, fear of AI that we see, fear of like, and, and here I'm not talking about the chatbot things, I'm talking about, you know, uh, true AI, a sentient um, application, is, and I think a lot of the, the fear of it is that if we create something more intelligent and more powerful than us, will it treat us the way we, will, we would if we were in that position? Um, so I think that there's a, a bit of a mirror there that... Um, we worry that um, 
I think a lot of this goes on in the, a lot of the human rights and, and sort of gay rights and things. It's like if we give everybody the same rights as us, will they treat us as badly as we've treated them? And there's that fear. So I think the same with AI in some way, in that we think, well, obviously it will enslave us all and you know use us as batteries in its power plant and and terminator robots because kind of that's what we would do um so hopefully you know we might create something that is slightly more intelligent than that and sees the world as a, a very small island of life and intelligence in a vast cosmos and decide that it needs preserving and work with us and for us to help us and preserve um alternatively there might be the there's uh oh what's the name of that game with the folding blocks the, the oh i know minecraft tetris oh tetris Te oh, tetris. oh okay <laughs> i heard about an experiment um where they tried to program an ai to um not lose at tetris so because it keeps coming down and if the box were so they it's it was not to lose at tetris so it paused the game um so they <laughs> they might decide well we're going to preserve all life so we're going to just put the whole of the earth into storage um or you know they might help us or they might decide that we're too much of a threat to their power source and wipe us out who knows i mean it could go could go any way um i tend to have ais as quirky and helpful um in my books because i think they make fantastic characters um and i think the the old scary scary ai thing has been done to death i mean it's you know there are episodes of star trek in the 60s where um there were computers telling people to kill themselves and stuff and it was all going until kirk showed up and pointed out it was stupid and then they decided to reorganize their whole society so <laughs> it's not it doesn't count until he says it so <laughs> i think that comment about a mirror is really interesting because when you think about it any any story that I've seen with AI not ending horribly is seen almost as, you know, naive, naivete, or uh, making up this utopia that's definitely not going to happen. But if I really like the the point you made about it being a mirror, because the fact that we can only see this ending badly, our creation acting the way we would, <laughs> I think that's a really poignant way to put that. Uh, I know like the Murderbot series is very popular and a lot yes. of that is because it's it has that kind of quirky feeling to it and doesn't have that doom and gloom feel, which I think for many people felt fresh when they first picked it up. Uh, so I think you really have a point there. Also, they're, they're sort of using Star Wars as a case study for AI as well, where it never evolved into this enormous um, godlike intelligence it just remained at a normal kind of human level and so you just have all these droids wandering around kind of like a, an underclass um and fairly expendable with the combat droids and stuff but they are ai they're wandering around they just it's just become part of the furniture the daniel commented i googled the peer pressure from dead people line and was pleased to see it attributed to ice tea then I found the same line in a vampire <laughs> romance novel published a year earlier in that than that tweet. It's interesting. Ice tea, yeah. Maybe we've just outed iced tea as a vampire romance reader. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna endear him to so many more people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. I hope that's true. God, I hope yeah. that's true. <laughs> Me too. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, um, I want to bring it. Um, and it while well, with some fascinating conversations we have here about uh, AI, especially, um, I want to bring it back a little bit outside of of that discussion to more book specific stuff. In terms of, um, you wrote this wonderful book with um, with Peter K. Peter F. Hamilton, sorry, 
And um, you know, you've written a lot of, you've written dozens and dozens of short stories, you've written, you know, two dozen novels yourself. Um, this one is uh, is co-written. Um, uh, what's it like to to co-write, uh, to co-author a book with another author? And you know, I, I I mean, I found that here the prose was seamless. You know, I I didn't I don't know how you wrote it or whether you know one author wrote one chapter, et cetera. But but I, I you know, I, it sounded like one authorial voice is what I'm saying, right? So so what's it like to to co-author a, a book like this with with someone else? It's, it was a lot of fun, actually. It was, uh, I, I guess, the nearest I can do is probably like two guitarists jamming on the same record or something. But it was, yeah, we, um, when we decided to, to write something together, um, we threw a few ideas around and eventually we came up with a kind of, um, you know, throw, I'd throw over an idea for a character and Peter would come back with a, a society that would model that and then come back. And we, we went back and forth quite a lot. And then when we had something we thought had legs, um, I went over to uh, his office and we sat there and um, we we kind of just broke it down into like scenes. You know, we'll need a scene here, we'll need a scene there, we'll need a scene here, we'll need a scene on this society, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, well, I'll write that bit, you write that bit. You know, we just divvied it up. And I wrote most of the scenes set on the starship with the, the sort of character-based stuff. And he wrote most of the um, different societies. Um, but we we kind of, did you ever play that party game as a child where you write a sentence and then fold the paper over and then the next child writes the next sentence and then you, yeah. And then you come up with this story and that's how we did it. You know, he would write a, a chapter and send it to me and then I'd write the next chapter and send it back. And then so that if we wrote them all out of order, I don't think they would have felt as cohesive. So doing it that way, we could read back and so we could write sort of cohesively with what had gone before. And then afterwards, we both edited it. So we both so both our voices kind of crossed into the other. So that's, I guess, why it feels quite seamless. Um, but also we, we, you know, our, our kind of styles seem to mesh pretty well, which wasn't something I was expecting because obviously he writes books the size of phone books and I write like much shorter sort of um, fast paced stuff. So, um, but it was a lot of fun. It was a huge amount of fun. And I got to read new Peter Hamilton fiction before anyone else, which was kind of cool. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, again, you know, love the book. There were a lot of things, uh, so many things in here, you know, like, a timeless love story, um, you know. Um, the one thing again that struggled with this book was that, you know, was frankly, and, and I say this, you know, uh, it's the only problem is the prose was fantastic, right? You know, it was, it was the prose was was wonderful and sometimes very lyrical and poetic, and of course dealing with some big themes here. But um, I I understand that, you know, um, from what I'm gathering about you is that you're uh, a character driven. Uh, writer, so you your your books are which appeals to me as a reader because I'm very much a character driven reader, and I think a character driven writer myself. So, in terms of this collaboration, uh, like you said, so was was you was it you more focusing on you know the character based stuff in in this novel? Is that how it worked? Yeah, I mean, Peter put in a lot of stuff about strange lits and subatomic particles and physics and and. I let him do that because he knows that stuff better. And um, the thing I know is how to write characters. And, and you know, my, my spaceships tend to be quite, I like to make them plausible, but I don't know how they work. So, um, whereas was he's much more kind of, um, has that much more technical frame of mind. So. Wow. So, um, and in saying that is, are you, do you, so your, your series, um, your main series, I guess, that you're best known for, you know, Emmer's Worthy Belief. So that essentially would be, we, if we're looking um, to kind of like your sales pitch for that, it's a character-based, driven, like more space opera kind of thing. Can you talk a bit about that that series? Uh, definitely. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a trilogy. Uh, starts with Embers of War, um, and it's character-based. It's told uh, by a group of five or so narrators. 
uh, one of whom, who is arguably the main character, is a sentient warship who has um, resigned following a um, an atrocity that was carried out to end a very destructive war. Um, but she accidentally developed a conscience, which is the last thing you need in a warship. Um, so she resigned, and obviously warships have never resigned before, so that, that was kind of weird. And she's gone off and she's joined this uh, rescue organisation. Um, and she's um, she's a very interesting character because she's struggling um, to work out who she is. Um, her, a lot of her neural architecture is based on um, stem cells from, from a dead soldier that they've used to kind of uh, create this AI and they've cut it in with canine DNA to, to give her a pack loyalty to, to the rest of the fleet. Um, and separated from that, and with her armament gone, she's kind of struggling to be good and to be helpful, but at the same time, she's kind of hardwired to blow things up and so she's kind of like where and, and it's that teenage th at one point i think she says that she's a teenage girl with all the social graces of a missile and that's kind of her struggle and i think for some reason that's really resonated with a lot of people because i think we've all been teenagers and we've all been you know where do i fit in what do i do what's the struggle between being good and just giving vent to my anger and my feelings and uh, through the two sequels, uh, Fleet of Knives and Light of Impossible Stars, she um, and her crew go through this uh, huge experience, um, accidentally awaken something very ancient and powerful. The whole of humanity is in jeopardy. Um, they struggle, they fight, they lose comrades, they gain new comrades. Um, but the main kind of o overarching uh, storyline is her struggle to become who she is, find out who she is and become who she is. And I think that's really, you know, a lot of people write to me and say, oh, my God, Trouble Dog is my favorite character. I love Trouble Dog. Um, and I'm really pleased because I, I, I enjoyed writing her so much that uh, um, I'm really glad she caught, she struck a, a chord. Well, you've sold me on that. <laughs> I am also very much a character-based reader. And as, you know, I admitted, or, yeah, Steve too, right? All of us. <laughs> um, and as someone who already admitted I am new, admittedly new to the sci-fi genre, something that is always, I think, daunting for people making the leap maybe from fantasy is the science part of that, the science part of the name. Because um, you're maybe afraid that you won't understand something that's crucial to the story. So I really love hearing the way that you talk about this series and the way the themes that you talk about. Um, and this is a little bit more broad, just talking about the writing experience, saying that you enjoyed writing these, these characters so much. But PL often talks about as an author, how difficult it is to write maybe the second book in the series or the third book in a series. It's a different challenge from the first one. So I'm curious as someone who feels so deeply for your characters, of that trilogy, which one was the hardest for you to write? The first, the second, or the last? Actually, it was the last one. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wrote the second one really quickly after writing the first one. Um, but then when I came to write the third one, the first one had just come out and had come out to very, very good reviews and people were, yeah. So suddenly I felt performance anxiety. It's like with the second one, I just wrote it and it was fun and I got it, you know, I did it. With the third one, it was like, oh crap, now I'm going to have to tie this series up in a way that satisfies these people who are really enjoying book one. So suddenly it was... Um, suddenly the safety net had gone and I, I thought, oh God, I've got, I, I have to stick the landing. I have to deliver. So that, that, that was the, um, that, that was the most difficult. And, and during the course of the, uh, the, the, the trilogy as well, there were a couple of character deaths that hit me quite hard as well. Um, that I kind of thought, oh, gee, wish I hadn't killed them off. So, but yeah, it's, uh, 
I always love hearing when authors say that because it's like you have the control, but it seems like the way authors talk about it, you almost don't <laughs> like this needed to happen. So you suffer along with the readers almost. Well, I think if you create authentic characters, then you kind of can predict how they would respond and how they would act and what they would do in certain situations. Then you have to be true to that because if you suddenly make them act in a way that is different in order to satisfy your plot, I think it comes across as quite contrived. So sometimes you kind of follow their decisions and they paint themselves into a corner and you think, well, the only way I can get them out of this is to do something really contrived and really artificial or make them act in a way that the reader's going to go, hang on, what? she wouldn't do that. So, you know, you, you have to you have to follow through. So, Have you ever found yourself killing a character and then later on down the line, because you needed that character for something else, you just changed your mind, went back and saved them? Have you ever done that? Kind of. Um, in uh, I, I wrote a trilogy um, called the Akak Makak trilogy. Um, and it was basically, uh, the first book was basically a murder mystery. And the guy who is murdered before the beginning of the first book, um, but left a kind of a an electronic brain state recording that his his ex-wife picks up and, and plays and she can interact with. And that was just a uh, a way to kind of give a few clues and to get the mystery going and to show the relationship between the two of them. But the guy was dead. It's just an electronic recording. And I didn't think anything more of it, but he was still there at the end of the third book because the relationship that developed between the two of them became so fascinating that I just couldn't kill him off. You know, he, he I mean, he was dead before the first book started, but he just hung around as this electronic ghost and, and you know, his awareness of himself as a recording, you know, at one point she takes him to his own funeral. Um, so he knows that he, he, he's a recording, but the way that they are able to build a relationship that is very different from the relationship they had when he was alive, because obviously he's, he's her ex-husband, but now they they develop something much closer and much more real when a lot of the stuff has been stripped away um that he he and people kept writing to me and saying i just want to give him a big hug um and stuff so it's it's like he was supposed to be just you know dead and gone by the end of chapter two of the first book but he was still there at the end of the trilogy because you know he just demanded to be yeah i found that there are some characters uh, it seems like you feel the same, Garrett, that they've just demanded more agency and they're just kind of taken on this role that you didn't necessarily anticipate in, even if you're, you know, your 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 story's pretty well plotted out and you know what's gonna happen, you know, perhaps you've given someone a larger role than you know than you first thought because you know this character just speaks to you and you just feel that you know they're so compelling you need to to you know do something more with it. And that's kind of a fun experience as an author to have a character just kind of you gotta give you more. More page time. <laughs> There's a very famous example of that, which is Moby Dick, where um, Melville originally had a, a different main character in mind, but then as soon as he met Ahab, he just threw the other character literally overboard and con concentrated on Ahab because he just found it. Yeah, and he couldn't be bothered to go back and rewrite the beginning, so he just carried on. But yeah, yeah it's funny because you you've been reading you were reading Moby Dick, haven't you, been Taylor? You've been reading uh, Moby Dick. I was just about to say I've been triggered. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, I had a a classics challenge on my channel, um, and then Moby Dick. While I have really enjoyed my process of reading it so far, for some reason I just hit like a mental block, and that put a stop to that challenge. And I've been reading it since last year, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I haven't gotten the literal thrown overboard part yet, but I'm about to be there. So. <laughs> That'll add some context, I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm enjoying it, though. It's a good book. <laughs> Braver than I am. Uh, Daniel had a comment. Uh, ancient and powerful along the lines of a fire upon the deep, or is that not a good comparison? Mm. Kind of a comparison, yeah. So just wondering, too, as well, Gareth, you know, you mentioned a lot of, uh, I know, like you, I... I did read quite a bit of sci-fi when I was younger. I was, for some reason, I, 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 I 
gave it over to fantasy, and then of course I ended up writing it. But you know, Philip K. Dick and 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 Asimov and a lot of these writers, you know, I read when I was younger. Um, who are your influences? You you think the great writers of the genre? Who are the people that that really inspired you to to? You know? I think different writers inspired me at different times. Um, I think this, you know, I, I tried to write sci-fi for ages and I was writing kind of Arthur C. Clarke, Larry Niven type stuff, which I wasn't really, it, it wasn't, I wasn't really having a, a, a much success with it because, you know, it was all, you know, alien invasions where the president is, and I don't know anything about presidents or what it's like to be in Cheyenne Mountain or whatever. So suddenly I, I picked up this copy of, um, Burning Chrome by William Gibson, his short story collection. And it was all about people on the street. It was about normal people trying to live normal lives, trying to get by. And then seeing that with like the movie Alien, which is just about some, you know, people there to get their bonuses. And, you know, they're not heroic space captains or whatever. They're just normal people. And that kind of flicked a switch in my head and suddenly I knew I just had to start writing about normal people I just had to start writing about people I knew um and that made all the difference suddenly I was writing about characters I was not instead of writing about these kind of big unwieldy situations I was writing about characters and I was writing about um things that are important to people and that really kick-started my my career properly um that's you know and I found my voice and I everything led from there really um mentioned earlier ian banks I, I guess he would be a huge influence and um yeah uh, i mean so many of it is difficult to to um yeah uh, uh, ursula le guin um yeah it's i mean there, there are so many it's diff di difficult to pick them out but uh yeah, definitely. Um, that was definitely a turning point with the Gibson and, and Alien and Aliens. Yeah. If someone were to ask you where where the best place to start with your work is, uh, what would you recommend? Where would you recommend they start with your with your work? Uh, well, Embers of War is a very good place to start. It's the first of a three book trilogy, but it, you can read it as a standalone because it's a fairly self contained story, um, and it's um, it's probably quite accessible you know it's about a warship and there's big huge enormous space stuff going on and, but I explain it very simply it's like uh the comparison I make was if I was writing a story set in the modern day and I wanted my character to, to jump in the car and go to Aldi I wouldn't have like three and a half pages explaining the eternal combustion engine and the history of American Arab um relationships to do with OPEC and and so so they would just get in the car and go so that's kind of what happens you know they get in the spaceship and go and it's you know if you i imply how it works but not you know only to the level of you put the petrol in this end and you go so um rather than getting into all that kind of deep heavy um scientific stuff so to continue a little bit on the topic of inspiration um, you know, you obviously have these authors who've inspired you to write the way that you do, uh, and who have inspired you to write the type of characters that you do. But these characters have to have a place to live or a place to inhabit. And in a lot of your books, this is space, right? So I happen to be very lucky that my father worked on the James Webb Space Telescope, which is, you know, has all of these amazing, incredible pictures coming through. Um, you know, one picture has thousands of galaxies in, in one snapshot. So I'm wondering if real world space things, <laughs> whatever that may be, if those help inspire the settings for your stories, for these characters to inhabit, because space is infinite. There is yeah. an infinite number of stories and settings you could play with. So I'm wondering where you kind of pull that inspiration from. Yeah, I mean, I do find those kind of pictures hugely inspiring. And when I was a kid, as well as, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, we also had the the Skylab was up at the time. So we were on TV, seeing astronauts fl floating around and, you know, bouncing off each other and uh, and doing all that. We were still, there were still Saturn launches going on and so on. So 
Um, and then the space shuttle came along and, you know, we, we were pretty much sure that we would all be living on Mars by 1984. Um, and you know, obviously, uh, for better or worse, um, that didn't happen, but it, you know, it, it, that seemed, it seemed inevitable. It seemed that the space shuttle would happen and then we would get, and, you know, so it felt like we were standing on the edge of that future. And that was very inspiring to be into sci-fi and to think, well, we've got all this to look forward to. This is all going to happen. Um, so we've kind of lost that a bit now. Um, I think, but at the time, yeah, that was a huge inspiration. I find the, uh, like the James Webb photos and stuff and the Hubble photos, they inspire some of the more philosophical parts of my books, I think, because you look at that and you think, well, there's a thousand galaxies and each galaxy has 300 billion suns. And, you know, there could be millions of intelligent races just in that one photograph. But that one photograph, the light from those galaxies has taken millions of years to get here. So even if they were there now, we couldn't possibly see, we have no way to detect them. They have no way to detect us. Um, and by the time, you know, if we ever do receive signals from them, we'll have been gone for millions of years. So it's, um, you know, we'll never know, basically. There could be huge galactic empires just just there and we just won't see them because by the time their signals or their light get to us we'll have been gone um so there's that's quite that kind of sense of cosmic smallness but at the same time of how significant we are um there's a lot of that in especially in the most recent novel there's a lot of um pontificating from a very old starship about our place in the cosmos and, and, and what it means and how we will never know for sure what's going on now so it's amazing so can you tell us a bit about the new novel gareth and what 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 you've what you've done with your new release congratulations again by the way thank you uh, the new novel, it's um, set in the same universe as Stars and Bones, uh, but it's they're both standalone novels. You can read them in any order. Um, but they're both set in the, as I mentioned, this fleet where um, humans tried to blow themselves up and the aliens stepped in and shooed us off Earth and put us in this fleet of gigantic arcs and uh, let us go off through the universe on the strict instructions we don't mess up any more biospheres and um so we're like cruising through through the universe in these thousand arcs and there are sort of smaller scout ships that go off ahead of the fleet to kind of scout the territory ahead and get into various scrapes and trouble um and in in descendant machine they discover a giant ring the size of saturn's rings with a, a dark globe the size of the planet earth in the middle and it's a machine and there's a small race of um caretaker um aliens who who were there who maintain the machine but they've lost in their history what the machine is or what it does or how it works you know they've got legends and they um and they, ha they have a holy man uh, who is the cu the custodian of the two big secrets. Um, and then, so when one faction decides they want to open the machine because they think inside must be a wormhole to um, their technological ancestors who built this thing. And so they decide we're going to make our planet great again. We're going to open this machine and reclaim our, our places at the top of the universal tables and things and it becomes very populist and uh, then there's another faction who uh, most of the humans are on which is like we think that's probably holding something really nasty in so it's probably best not to open it and so there's a race between the two factions to see whether you know who could get these two great secrets first and what happens when it opens so that's fascinating what that's it Pandora's sounds great. box in space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well said. What made you decide to um continue this novel in the same uh, broader universe that your your this this other your other series was? 
was set in instead of going on to something completely different. Well, when I finished the Embers um, trilogy, I wanted to create a new um, a new universe in which to tell stories. So I came up with this idea for, for Stars and Bones, this scenario. And I talked to my publisher and they were, they were like, what we really want and what we'd really like to see is some standalone novels set in the same setting um, because that is much more attention grabbing for readers than, than picking up a book and thinking, oh, I have to read another three books before I can read this one. So um, there's like a, a sense of a series, but at the same time, they can just pick them up in any order and it's more engaging for reviewers and readers and, and so on. So we decided to give that a try. So I, I built the um, the setting in such a way that I could tell many different stories in that setting. Um, and, I, you know, I may, at the moment, I'd have no more plans for that setting beyond those two books, but I could always return to it at any point if I think of a, a story that would suit. Fantastic. Now I have a someone question that, to, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just no, no, just a ahead. comment on that, which is someone needs to tell fantasy authors that because <laughs> <laughs> the n number of series <laughs> where it's like, you got to read eight books first. It was just a comment on that. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I better take that on. I better take that on <laughs> advisement. <laughs> Um, I, a couple of questions, two that are burning me. I'm going to ask the the first one first. Was that um, so, Gareth? You know, you you've obviously you're a very decorated writer. Um, you won awards. You know, you've written all these books. Um, do you feel uh, more is has this all the success and all the accolades? Do you feel that's more pressure or less pressure? So, in other words, you know, you know, you've you've you've, you've a best-selling author, you've won, you know, these writing awards, you've written successfully series, short stories, all these things. Does that make things easier in terms of when you sit down and write a book? Okay, you know, I know my craft. I, I, I'm working for continuous improvement. However, you know, I, I, I have a foundation and I'm, you know, or do you feel, is it more of the pressure of the success? Okay, well, I have to, you know, write a better novel each time or a better short story. How, how do you feel about, about that? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it's not all kind of cocaine parties and, and groupies here. It's um, it, it's not quite kind of that situation. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, I mean, I always, one thing I've always tried to do is try to make every book I write better than the one before. Um, and I think if I ever got to the point where I was just knocking something out for the sake of it, I I, I think that complacency would kill it and kill any talent I had. So I, I'm always striving to make each book as, as just as good as I can make it and put in as much as I can, like as much truth and authenticity and stuff as I can. So, I mean, it's always, I never feel, I never feel that I've made it, you know, um, I guess, I guess maybe if I won a Hugo and, and, got a movie contract or something, you know, I was sitting in a house in the canyon in Hollywood, whatever, I might think, well, yeah, okay. But I never, you know, sadly, the if the financial uh, rewards for uh, my level of success are not what you might hope. So I, I never kind of look back and think I made it. I'm always thinking, well, I've got to get another book deal, and, you know, I'd, rent pay so let's uh let's let's keep writing let's keep going um and I, you know i just want to tell as many stories as possible oh you're very you're very humble so yeah that's 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 fantastic but congratulations on on all the success that you have achieved so uh, no doubt. and you know i don't doubt that one day you you will you know i know you've been nominated for a locus before i'm not mistaken and and you know, so no doubt that you know that uh, that book deal, that's where that movie deal is coming uh, down the road. So you might see uh, see all your stuff on the big screen or the small screen, depending. So, um, so my second burning question is that uh, you are also married to another author. So that's it. So um, how does it? You know, so do you guys bounce all idea? I mean, I'm not trying to pry too much. Do you guys bounce ideas off each other? Uh, what's that like? You know, being uh, being married to a fellow and very successful. Fellow author, 
Uh, it's a huge, huge amount of fun. Um, yeah, we do. I mean, uh, we'll kind of, uh, we, we chat all the time on WhatsApp and, uh, and on Zoom. So uh, we'll just kind of send each other, you know, a page or two of what we're working on or a chapter of the latest thing we're doing and or a story or something and read it and kind of bounce these things back and forth. So that's, uh, that's really, it's really fun just to have somebody who completely gets it and knows what it's like to, 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 to do this and to who, I mean, she's a fantastic writer. She's, um, you know, whenever she gives me feedback, it, it's extremely um, uh, incisive and, and, and spot on. So, um, and just to have somebody who can, you can, because sometimes writing a novel is very lonely because it takes like six months or something. And, you know, it's not like, um, you know, if you work in an office, you can turn to the guy on the desk next to you and go, oh, this job fucking sucks, doesn't it? Um, and, and, and chat and, you know, so you come, but, you know, having, you know, um, being married to somebody who gets that and who, who understands and it's, there's a, a, a great feeling of sort of mutual support there. So. Oh, that's amazing. I know you've, you've also written a nonfiction book, right? About writing, I believe is the title. So just while we're talking about the craft of writing, yes, there we go. <laughs> Uh, you uh, also, I know, have Q and A's on Twitter and things like that, where you like to give out advice to, to fellow authors. So, is there? I maybe there isn't. There, <laughs> there is no catch all. But is there a base level, like a basic level of advice that you would give anyone who maybe doesn't have that person to bounce it off of, doesn't have a partner who knows what it's like? Uh, if someone's watching this and is really trying to work on their craft, what's something that you think could be universally applied? Um, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, always I, a winner. <laughs> I, I try not to give prescriptive advice. Like you sh must do this or you must do that. And you don't do that. Don't do that. So, so in the book, it's much more encouraging and like, this is what's worked for me but won't necessarily work for you. But here are some approaches you might like to try and here are some other approaches you might like to try. So I try very much to be more of a a coach and a, 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 a you know, just gently push people onwards than actually sit there and wag my finger and tell them what they should and shouldn't do. Um, when it comes to, you know, very, very basic advice, I mean, just read. I mean, read good books and find out why they're good. Read bad books and find out why they're bad you know if there's a book you hate go through it with a marker pen and find all the bits you hate and if there's a book you love what is it you love about it and just read critically read as a writer and just think mm. but also read to fill up the um the mental aquifer so that you know you you have to keep refilling that you have to keep refilling the creativity wells um and that's basically it. I mean, I, I've sadly, um, you know, I've done some, um, well, quite a few uh, workshops at universities and so on around the, around the uh, Europe and, and what have you. And there will always be a student who, well, I don't really read. Or I'm writing this fantasy epic, nine book fantasy epic. <laughs> oh, really? And, but I don't, I don't read fantasy. But I think it's quite commercial, so I decided to write fantasy, and it, it's just like, and their story is like the most basic, cliched rubbish that could have so easily have avoided by just reading some stuff and, and seeing how other authors have approached it and avoiding all the pitfalls. And oh man, sorry, I'm just having flashbacks to that guy. Um, <laughs> You so said, why would you write the first five five books of a fantasy series when A, you don't know anything about fantasy, and B, you haven't even sold the first one yet? I mean, the sheer amount of effort for, you know, and, and there was no way he was ever going to sell it because it was, it was dreadful. But um, just to expend that amount of effort on something without getting any feedback or without, you know, it, it, it boggles my mind. So don't do that don't do that read read lots of books and and take heed of what you're reading and read it read actively is i think would be my basic most most basic you know don't even pick up a pen unless you've done this advice yeah. 
That as a fellow a reader, I love that. <laughs> sign on, sign off on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's some great advice that that I I hold dear as well. Um, you know, Gareth, what we said that specifically that advice, and and I I totally concur. I think I think Stephen Taylor, myself, we all do. What would you say to that advice? You know, I've heard. You know, and every everyone's different. Uh, some writers, for example, say that um, they have issues or troubles reading um, too much while they're writing because they find that they can get an imprint of that those particular authors, um, you know, works on their own, or they start to mimic the style of the authors they're writing, or that they have a hard time concentrating on, you know, their own, you know, where they're going with their their books when they. What do you say about about you know? that I don't have that issue but that doesn't mean it's not valid it doesn't mean that some people might not feel that I don't personally don't have that issue I, I find it it helps me as you said like you know the more I read I think I feel the better I write but but how do you how do you address that something like that if that's that's your concern I mean I, I don't have that so much I mean I understand it in that I if I've been reading if I'm writing something in the first person and I've been reading something in the third person sometimes I'll sit down and I'll start writing in the third person and I catch myself oh damn it and I have to go back and change but I, I tend to like to start the day by reading for a little while, like 15, 20 minutes of reading, because it just kind of keys the brain into the, the kind of rhythms and the, the, the fiction mindset. It kind of uh, opens that door in the head just to kind of get into just the words and the, um, rather than just sitting down cold. So, um, and I, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be nonfiction. It can be whatever. I don't find it carries over, um, because I've kind of, I've very much got my own kind of voice now that's that seems to have appeared. And but you know, so at the moment I'm reading um, Stephen King's The Stand for the first time because. Uh, Diane could not believe I had not read it, so I was tasked to read it. So, um, so I'm reading that, and that's very, very different from what I'm writing, and quite different from the way I write. But I'm finding it really. Um, I find if you read something that fires your imagination, and then when you go to write, your imagination is warmed up and, and it's fired, and it's kind of already thing. So you can apply that energy to your book, um, which. So, you know, I, I, I find reading a, a great warm up for writing. Um, but, you know, different different folks have different experiences. Well, that's great advice using reading as something to propel your, you know, get those creative juices going on. That's that's great advice, I think. So um, you've also, I mean, you, you, you do so much, you're, you're a writer, you, you know, the, the book you've written on on writing with some writing advice. Thanks for writing that. That's that's something that I think all of us who aspire to write or who are currently writing can use. That's great, especially from. I wrote that one by accident. How can you, how so? Can you can you tell us about that? Well, uh, when, I, when I started off writing, I had a, a blog back in the. Does anyone remember the old blogger.com days? Um, I, I had a blog, and so I would just kind of write about the stuff I was finding out as I was going along to help other people who were coming along. So it's stuff that I'd never, you know, stuff I was not taught in school, like about passive and active voice, um, how to write a synopsis, all that kind of stuff. So I was writing this all as a blog. And then uh, when I left that, I, I kind of backed up all the posts into a Word document and it came out like 60,000 words or something. And I, I tweeted, oh, I just seem to have accidentally written a book. And the publisher just came back and said, yes, we will publish this. So, um, yeah, it, that's how it came about. So obviously there was some editing and tidying. And um, it originally came out from a small publisher. And then Galantz took it and, and, and they brought out a, a much expanded hardback with an extra 20,000 words of new stuff in there so but yeah I never set out to do that I mean my imposter syndrome would not have let me do that if I'd sat down on page one to do it um but yeah so it, it kind of just came about from my experiences as that's why I called it a field guide because it's all stuff that I learned and wrote in the field as I, as I was going through rather than sat and wrote about later 
Are there are there any uh, lesser known authors or series that you would recommend or that more people should be reading that aren't necessarily on the on the radar that you've uh, you'd wanted to spread the word about? Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, D- Diane has a, a four volume space opera series called called the Questrison Saga, Questrison Saga um, which if you you look her up on the, at J Diane with two N's Dotson on Instagram or or Twitter you can find links to her page and stuff um and that series yeah definitely that deserves a much wider readership it's got great reviews um people love it um but uh it's, it's maybe not got the um uh awareness that it that it it deserves uh apart from that i'm re- uh just reading uh fellow titan author stark holborn she's got a series uh two books called uh, Hell's Eight and oh, Ted Lo, Ten Low and Hell's Eight. They're um, kind of space futuristic space westerns, um, which are amazing and which I think will do very well. So uh, hopefully they will. Um, the books I've been really enjoy- I've really been enjoying Adrian Tchaikovsky's last two trilogies, but I mean he hardly needs me to. Uh, Give him a shout out there because he's he's you know um, doing amazingly well with those. So yeah, those are both definitely on my my radar, Tchaikovsky and, and Diane series. So yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, well, might we see any? I know you might be able to might be able to spill the beans. Might might we see any collaborations between Diane and yourself in the future on, on um, a sci-fi book? We we've we've hit some ideas back and forward. Uh, we've we've got our own uh, own stuff to work on at the moment, but you know, sometime definitely would love to do that. Yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I imagine there's got to be some ideas that you've both come up with, and neither one of you can actually claim. So to be able to put those together into one would be, I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Be a lot of fun, yeah. The, uh, the time always flies on these, but um, before we let you go, um, I'd like to finish off the episodes with the last question. And that question is, uh, what was your first job? What was my first job? Well, probably a hospital cleaner. Hmm. Uh, when I was, uh, um, when I was uh, in uh, what we call the sixth form, which is uh, over here, which is... Uh, 17, 18, um, studying for my final high school exams. I used to work on the weekends in the, the local hospital, just uh, cleaning and sweeping and hoovering and, and stuff for, you know, beer money for the evening. So, and, uh, <laughs> what did you uh, What did you learn from that experience or what did you take away from that experience that's, that's carried with you throughout your life? Um, the people doing essential jobs tend to be a lot lower paid than people doing non-essential ones. Hmm. Um, and the, you know, the reality is messy and smelly. Um, and looking after people is a really good thing to do. Hmm. Um, and working, uh, for things that don't benefit people is just a complete waste of time. Well, uh, we want to thank you again for, we know you're very busy. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, but before, uh, before we go, can you tell everyone where to find you? Where's the best place to, to find you and your work? Um, my website is www.garethlpowell.com. There's links there. Um, or I'm on uh, Instagram as at Gareth L. Powell. I'm on um what remains of twitter is at gareth l powell um and there's uh links links on there to a link tree which has all my social media and my books and and, and all sorts and my um i run online master classes as well uh for in creative writing so uh, there's, there's links to those as well so. awesome so uh pl before we go can uh, can you tell us where people can find you and your work um Books www.plstore.com. Uh, social media preferred channel is 
as Gareth said, Twitter at PL Start Right. Uh, beside you and Taylor, of course, I'm Paige Chewing again. Uh, I'm an assistant editor with Before We Go Blog. So reviews on Before We Go Blog and on Goodreads. Hope to have a review up on Light Chaser uh, in the next in the coming weeks. It's great and plan to read. Uh, you know, definitely uh, Gareth more of Gareth's uh, work. Uh, I quickly want to say. Um, you know, Gareth, one thing that we didn't get a chance, unfortunately, to talk about is that, you know, Gareth, again, too modest, but he is wonderfully inspirational on, wonderfully inspirational on social media. Uh, he's someone who boosts fellow writers and is very much an active member of the writing community in terms of social media and really helps helps us all out and is very positive and is just one of those, you know, um, you know, when people think of really successful writers, sometimes you think they might be a bit, you know, uh, standoffish or, you know, um, may may not, but this is someone who obviously gives back and cares generally, cares about people. So thank you for all you do, Gareth, for 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 that. So I just wanted to say that that definitely has not gone, you know, unrecognized by me, and I'm sure a lot of other people. So thank you. Okay. And Taylor. So you can find me on my BookTube channel made between the pages. Uh, it's written below. <laughs> um, I also host page chewing on my channel, so you can find find uh, episodes over there as well. Um, you can find my reviews on Before We Go blog, where I'm assistant editor, just like uh, PL mentioned. I am also on the bare bones, what is left of Twitter. I'm still hanging in there <laughs> along with <laughs> others in this chat, it, it appears. Uh, but you can always find those links in the descriptions of my video. And uh, I do just wanna say again, Thank you so much for coming. I, I know Steve already mentioned we know you're busy, but uh, it means a lot that you that you took the time to talk to us. And I'll have you know you've sold me on you know your books, like Embers of Embers of War. Here I come, <laughs> character based reader. I'm all over that. So uh, I really, <laughs> I really look forward to getting to it. Truly, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming by and also thanks to everyone in the chat for uh for interacting with us that always makes it a great experience so thanks to everyone for tuning in or listening and all the links will be down below in the description whether it's on the podcast or on youtube so be sure and check all those out so until next time hope everyone has a great rest of their day <laughs>